We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt. Uh, I'm uh, one of the pastors here at ACC and it's just always a privilege to teach from the stage and to get wet next to the baptistry. Um, that's what this is, I promise. All right. Um, anyway, I'm glad you're here because we're in week two of our, our series called Movers and Shakers. And if you've never heard this phrase before, uh, a mover and a shaker is that person in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family, who is just, they're, they're willing to move things around and shake things up to get the job done, right? They're, they're the one who can always move that project to the next phase because they're a mover and they're a shaker. And we've been talking about what does it look like to be a mover and a shaker in our faith? What does it look like to be, instead of stagnant, to be that person who's constantly making the next move and shaking up whatever needs to get out of the way so that we can move on into the next stage of spiritual maturity? Last week, we, we had this concept of the importance of worshiping corporately regularly, right? Worshiping regularly, what you're doing right now, that's really good. Today, we're going to talk about the second thing, and there's five things that you need to do if you want to be a mover and a shaker. We talked about worship regularly. Today, we're going to talk about growing personally. A better way to put this is if on Sundays we worship regularly together in a corporate environment, what happens between Sundays? When you walk out of here, what is it that you're doing to further develop your faith from Monday to Saturday? What are you doing on your own at home? And what you ought to be doing, if you want to be a mover and a shaker, you ought to be growing personally at home. You know, I've heard a lot of people say certain things to me when uh, maybe they're leaving this church and going to another church, or they're coming from another church to this church, and you have a conversation about that. And, and the, the most common wording that I hear when somebody's explaining to me a move from one church to another is they say this phrase, I just wasn't being fed. You've probably even said that before. If you think about it, you've probably moved from one ministry to another and, and said, I just wasn't being fed there. But I want to um, think about that phrase for a moment and how it really kind of highlights something that might be unhealthy. If you only eat once every seven days, then of course, if, if your strategy for spiritual growth is to come into church for an hour a week and to let the pastor open up God's word and, and read it to you and, and help you understand what it says, and then you go out of this room and for the next six days you're not eating anything, well, guess what? You're going to come in here on a Sunday starving. And, and, and probably you're going to be relying on me as the pastor, whoever's up on the stage, to feed you. And if I'm not feeding you, if you're thinking, you know what, I didn't get anything out of that message. It was a little boring, a little slow. I was a little tired. You're going to walk out of this room and think to yourself, you know what, I'm just not being fed. Well, guess what? You have the ability to learn how to feed yourself. How cool would it be if as a church, we showed up on a Sunday morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, all right? If we showed up on a Sunday morning so full that we've been eating the, the Word of God and consuming it and devouring it all week long, that when we walked in here on a Sunday, we're just worshiping God out of the overflow. It doesn't matter if we have a pastor get up and preach a message. It doesn't, and those things are still going to happen. But you're thinking, you know, I don't need the pastor to be uh, really great today. I don't need this really awesome message today because I have been feeding myself all week long. That ought to be the goal, is that we're learning how to grow personally between Sundays. Are you a growing Christian? Do you see evidence that you're, you're maturing in your faith? Do you come starving each Sunday 
requiring me to feed you? Or are you feeding yourself? You know, kind of in life, this is also true. You can only be young once, but you can be immature forever. You can only be young once in your faith. You can, you know, there's, there's a period of time where you give your life to Jesus and you're this new baby in Christ. And maybe for that first two, three months, everyone would be like, oh, it's a brand new believer. Maybe the first year you can get away with this title. I'm just a baby in Christ, right? You can be young in faith one time, but you can be immature in your faith your whole life. That's not a good thing, by the way. I'm not encouraging that choice. But the truth is, that we need to learn how to grow up in our faith. In Hebrews 6, it says, so let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repentance, of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. The writer of Hebrews is saying, Surely we don't need to stick with the the basics over and over again because we're a a church full of people who won't feed themselves. Now certainly there's people in this room who, even a baby, right? A baby's born, a baby doesn't know how to feed itself. Someone has to slowly teach that child how to take a spoon and dip it into something and then take that spoon and eventually get it in their mouth, right? It's a process. And I understand some of you are thinking, I'm brand new to this thing. I don't know how to feed myself. I'm really glad you're here. That's one of the core goals of a Sunday morning is for us to teach you how to feed yourself. And so we want to learn how to do that and get away from these over and over again, repetitive, basic teachings about Christ because we need to be growing and maturing. So what is maturing? What is this concept of maturity? When I say to grow, what does that mean? In this case, what it means is we need to become more like Christ. Maturity in Christ is simply put, becoming more like Christ. Uh, that we're, uh, maturity would equal Christ-likeness. Now guess what? There's not a single one of us in this room, not any one of us, myself included, that is like Christ, exactly like Christ. Now you can become really similar to Christ and, and really represent Christ well, you can become Christ-like, but none of us have arrived. In other words, this message about spiritual maturity is for all of us in this room. I don't care if you've been saved for 60 years and you've been spending time in God's word the whole time and you're really, really mature in the faith. I'm glad that you did that, I'm glad you're here, but the truth is even you, can become more like Christ. So there's not a in this message today, all right? We all want to learn how to grow more in our Christ-likeness as we grow personally. So we have this main passage of Scripture I want to read with you. It's in the book of 1 John. If you have a Bible with you this morning, open up to 1 John. It's at the end of the New Testament, not all the way at the end, but closer to the end. It's not the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's not the fourth book of the New Testament. It's a little, all right? And and in 1 John chapter 2, I want to read to you three verses. And you're going to notice in these three verses that there are three stages of spiritual maturity that John is talking about, all right? So here's what he says. He says, I am writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. He says, I'm writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. So he's, he's, so far he's talked about these brand new children. He's talking about maturity. And then now he's gonna talk about the, the phase in the middle. He says, I'm writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won your battle with the evil one. And now he's gonna repeat the three. He says, I have written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I have written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. And I have written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. So what we see in this passage is John is talking to three different audiences in the church. And by the way, a healthy church has all three of these. We'll talk more about that in a minute, all right? 
So in this room right now, if you've made a decision to follow Christ, you're going to fit into one of these categories. Let me show you the first one. The first one is a, a stage we call a child stage, right? You just gave your life to Christ. Uh, you're super excited. You have, you've probably heard the phrase before, uh, uh, a childlike faith. A childlike faith, by the way, doesn't doesn't require a big, deep understanding of all the in and outs of God's Word. It's not like you have to go to school and study at a seminary before you can have enough faith to give your life to Jesus. No, a childlike faith is just a basic understanding of the gospel. A childlike faith sounds something like this. I recognize that I am broken and that there is a good and holy God, and that because I am a sinner, I can't stand in God's presence. I can't be with him in heaven. And God loves me so much, he didn't like that, so he sent his son, Jesus, to die on a cross. It looks something like that. And Jesus died on the cross and then conquered death, and that through Jesus, I can take my sin, my brokenness, and I can put it on Jesus, and he will have paid for it on the cross. And so that one day when God sees me, he doesn't see my sin He sees the righteousness of his son. That's the gospel. I don't got to read all all these pages and all these words to to understand the goodness of the gospel. God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. His son conquered death, and by putting your faith in him, you can conquer death too. That's the basic understanding. You can have a childlike faith. You don't have to understand how all that works. You can can just basically come to God with a, a childlike understanding You know, one thing I've learned, though, about children, I'm going to give you a few words, and if you're a parent in this room, I think you'll appreciate these words. I want to describe children to you. Uh, Picture like a three-year-old, right? A really young child. A three-year-old, a child, is is one word I think that's really good is lazy. I mean, they're not making any of their meals. They're not doing any of their own laundry. They're uh, he, he, they're, they'll, they'll just cry, right? And you just ask them to clean up their toys, right? They, you just made a mess. I need you just to clean that up. Children by nature don't want to do those things, and they want you to do those things for them. That's just kind of part of being a child. Eventually, obviously, you, you help them learn how to clean up after themselves, and eventually start, you know, making their own bed and doing their own laundry and maybe cooking some meals. Those things happen. But at first, children are lazy, Another thing I think that really defines children is, is they can be really rude, can't they? They don't know the social norms that you and I maybe have learned. They don't know when it's okay to, to, to pop into a room and, and make loud noises, right? They make bodily noises when it's probably not appropriate. They'll, they'll interrupt conversations. They'll, their volume will be way too loud. In the middle of a situation like this, they'll, 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 they'll make a lot of noise and cry. And they just don't know that socially that's not acceptable. It's a bit rude. In fact, if they behaved like that, When they were older, if one of you were behaving like that right now, we'd be like, well, that guy's really rude. Children just, they haven't learned yet. You know, they talk with their mouth full and they just, they don't care yet. Another thing I think that defines children is children can be really selfish. They they kind of think about their own stuff and things before they really care about the bigger picture and that's just kind of part of being a child sometimes. You know, another thing I think that defines children is they can be really mean if you think about it. They don't even know sometimes how mean they're being. They'll come up to a stranger in public and say something, and their parents are immediately mortified that you just said that to a total stranger. That's really mean. You don't say that to people. I have a, a one-year-old nephew. A, a, he, he's almost my nephew. My, my sister, Kim, she was up here singing this morning. She's on the final stages of adoption. And so his name's Sebastian. Sebastian's one year old, okay? And I like to take Sebastian and put him up on my shoulders. And Sebastian, he's a sweet kid. He, you know, he's not naturally trying to hurt me, but what he does, as soon as I put him up there, he just starts smacking my head like it's a drum. And it hurts. And then before I know it, I feel moisture. You know, he's drooling on my head. I'm thinking, what is going on? That's really mean, right? I don't get on your head and smack it. But he just doesn't know. He, he's, he's not being mean to be mean, but he's mean. If you've worked with kids, if you've worked in our preschool ministry or our nursery ministry, I bet you have a story about being bitten by a kid. 
Because that's like one of their community, I don't like this, I'm going to bite you. Right? That is mean. We don't do that. So children are at this stage of maturity where they, you know, they just don't know any better. They're, they're brand new to this thing called faith. They understand the gospel, but they haven't yet. Remember we talked about this concept a couple weeks ago of being all, uh, all shoot and no root. They're just excited about being part of community. They're excited that there's now this, this path that they can be forgiven of their sin and begin a relationship with Jesus. All the feelings of that, they're excited about all that stuff. But there's no roots yet to really support that kind of growth. That's just something that works with a childlike faith. You know, by the way, when I, when I talk about children, uh, sometimes when people think about what a healthy church looks like. If someone were to ask you right now to define a healthy church, you might be tempted to say that it's a place full of mature believers. Can I just say I disagree with you if that's what you think? Because I want this to be a place full of people who just gave their life to Jesus. I want this place to then be a place where those people from months ago are now young in their faith and they've moved on to the next stage of spiritual maturity. And I want to see people at the latter ends of, of the process too who are mature in their faith, discipling those who are brand new to faith. In fact, when you think about that just in a natural sense, I want every Sunday there to be a baby that interrupts me while I'm preaching. Because a church with no babies is a dying church. A church with no spiritual children is a dying church. In fact, if somebody told me my church is full of mature believers, and that's all we are, I would say your church sounds like a church of immature believers who don't know how to introduce Jesus to new people and bring them into this process of discipleship. So we want the whole process here. It's not wrong to be a child in your faith. It's wrong to stay there. If you're a child in your faith right now, we're really glad you're here. What a great place to give your life to Jesus and start this process. But don't stay there. All right, the next phase of this maturity process that John's talking about in 1 John is this, is this concept of youth. Being a, a, like a teenager in your faith. We see in 1 John 2, that, that second part of verse 14, it says, I have written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. Notice how he defines this teenager stage of your faith. He says that you are actually have grown to a place where you are strong. It says God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. How cool is it that we learn about this next phase of maturity and what we learn about it is that this is a group of people who have become stronger in their faith. They're walking on their own now. They're feeding themselves. They're bulking up. They're able to handle their own. And why is it? It says very clearly because they're spending time in the word of God. If you, that's the secret, by the way. If you want to move from a childlike faith to, to this next stage of maturity, it doesn't happen apart from the word of God. Spending time reading it and learning it and feeding yourself growing personally. If you want to be a mover and a shaker in your faith, you're not going to be able to do it unless you're spending time in God's word. Can you imagine if we had a teenager up in our student ministry? We have our first student ministry event right after third service for our, our rising sixth graders today. I'm really excited about that. And then our next big event next week. And uh, can you imagine if we had a student who is in our student ministry still walking around biting people whenever they were mad? Like, I, I'll be honest with you. If, uh, if I found out that we have a student upstairs biting people, we'd be having a conversation with parents and saying, hey, until they stop biting people, they're not welcome at this this, this gathering, because that causes a problem for other people. It's very dangerous, right? We don't kick our nursery babies out for biting people. We expect it. We're not happy about it, but it happens, right? And so we need to grow up into that next phase. And children, what we learn about how, how we know someone's gone from a child to a, a teenager, the evidence is that they've become stronger because they've been spending time in the Word of God. 
You know, when you first give your life to Jesus, like I said, it's all shoot and no root. But eventually what happens, if you want to be strong, look at this picture of this apple tree. Uh, It's not uh, a real apple tree. It's an illustration. But you'll notice how there's as much tree underground as there is above ground. If you want to grow strong in your faith and move from being a child and immature in your faith to the next level of maturity, you're going to have to grow strong roots. You're going to have to spend time in the Word of God and understanding and more and more each day what it is that you're reading. It says in Colossians 2, verses 6 through 7, it says, And now, just as you accepted Christ as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. It says, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Let your faith, or then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. This is the, this isn't rocket science. If you want to grow roots so that you can be strong in the faith above ground and you can bear much fruit, you've got to spend time in the word of God. And I promise you this, Satan doesn't want you to grow strong in the Word of God. Satan does not want you to be strong. If if you've given your life to Jesus and you're at that childlike faith stage, he already recognizes that he's lost the major battle. He already realizes that you've given your heart over to the the, the God who loves you and, and can save you, right? But what he wants to then do is make sure that you certainly don't grow up into your faith, that you certainly don't uh, cause other people to come to faith, that you're essentially just a, a useless Christian who's not making any impact in the kingdom of God. Can you imagine for a moment if there was a, a middle school, you were a coach of a middle school football team, and you thought it was a good idea to call up the Ravens and say, hey, we would like to scrimmage y'all. We want to see how, we just want to kind of see how our our plays, our practices have been going. So full tackle, don't, don't, you know, whatever, we're doing the whole thing. We want the Ravens to come and play. Essentially what happens when you refuse to grow up and mature in your faith, it's like saying to Satan and his, his kingdom is strong. I'm telling you, he's got a lot of power and a lot of ability to, to mess things up in your life. It's like saying, I want to continue to just be this spiritual baby or even this, this next phase of spiritual teenager and refuse to really go beyond that. You're going to get pummeled. You're going to get pummeled. So we want to continue to grow. We don't want to stop there. In fact, another just encouragement to young people, one thing I've learned about Uh, It probably happens from like teenage years up to about like your your mid-20s. There's this phase of life where a lot of young people think they've got it all figured out. They know it all. You know, I've heard it in my home. Dad, you don't know what you're talking about. Can I just warn you, if you are young in your faith, or even in this, this phase here where you're like a teenager in your faith, don't get so overly confident that you refuse to submit to the encouragement and advice and admonition of believers who are further along in their faith than you are. Make sure you're paying attention and listening and growing. Because that actually leads to the, the third stage of maturity, which is this parent stage. And you might think, well, why would you use the word parent? John didn't use that word. He actually did. In 1 John 2... Verse 13, you don't see it in the English, right? It says, I am writing to you who are mature in the faith. That word mature, those words mature in the faith actually comes from the Greek. It's the word uh, padres. And that, that word actually means father. He says literally here, if you were reading it in the original Greek, he's saying, I'm writing to you who are fathers in the faith. You know, fatherhood... Is, is kind of, we understand that to be that next layer. Think about what fathers do that are, that's different than a, maybe a, a 20-something, okay? One thing that fathers do that's different is they reproduce, right? You can't be a father or a mother. This parenting phase, it, you don't get that title unless you've reproduced. 
And likewise, if you've grown to this level of maturity in your faith, one of the ways you're going to know it is you're going to see that you are a disciple who is making disciples, that you're passing your faith on to the next generation, that new people are coming into faith because of your life and your testimony, and that those new people are becoming more and more like Christ because you're helping to to train them up and raise them. That's something that's different between someone who's just strong in the Word of God versus someone who's reproducing their faith in other people. Another thing that's different about this fatherhood stage or this parenting phase is that when you're a parent, you recognize that you sacrifice for yourself, but not just yourself anymore, but now for others, right? As a parent, I don't just earn a living to take care of me, right? I earn a living to provide for my wife and my children. And so when you're at this fatherhood stage of your spiritual walk, one of the ways you're going to know is that you're sacrificing so that other people can grow, You're giving up your time and your money and your resources so that other people can grow into Christ-likeness also. Another thing that's different I've learned about parents or fathers or parents in general, mothers as well, is mothers and fathers, they have have wisdom. If they're a good father or a good mother, they're going to be a place where uh, I remember often calling up my mom and my dad and calling up my dad and just, I got, dad, I got a question. What would you do in this situation? Are you at that stage of your life where younger believers are calling you or looking up to you for biblical wisdom? See, that's that fatherhood stage. And so when you look at those three stages, I want you to think for a moment, where are you at? Are you a brand new believer? And maybe you've been a Christian for 40 years, but you're like, I still have the immaturity of a brand new believer, I'm still in my faith, the one walking around being rude and biting people and I just don't realize what I'm doing. Or if you started spending time in God's word and you're growing strong and you're standing on your own two feet in your faith, you're learning how to stand up against the evil one. Or you even beyond that at the last stage of spiritual maturity where you're reproducing your faith in other people and you're sacrificing to help other people grow and you're doing all these things that we just talked about fathers and mothers doing. Where are you at? It says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, verse 20. It says, dear brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Be innocent as babies when it comes to evil, but be mature in understanding matters of this kind. I want to think about this for a moment too. One thing I love about, I think, a good father, when you get to this last stage of maturity, a good father still has a lot of boy and a lot of youth in him. Some of the best youth workers, you know, at the event we're going to have next week, we do this like kind of launch of this ministry year, and uh, the best youth workers are those who still got a lot of child in them and got a lot of youth in them. Got the energy, the excitement uh, that came with their newness of their faith, and they're able to uh, show that to other people, and yet they still have a maturity where people are seeking them for wisdom and they're discipling other people. They got all those stages all wrapped up into one. And so that's what this maturity looks like, that we all should want. And so I would hope you'd ask the question, well, what do I do to move on to the next stage? I want to be a mover and a shaker I recognize where I'm at on this chart, and I want to move on to the next level of maturity. What is it that I need to do? And I'm going to give you real quick those three things, all right? The first one is this. You, you must be alive to grow. This seems like a no-brainer. But if you're in this room right now and you have not given your life to Jesus yet, you are still spiritually dead, and you will not be able to grow into the next level of spiritual maturity because you have not started with life, new life in Christ. It actually says, right, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. New life in Christ. You know when we baptize people here, we just did 
to uh, this morning. Right before I baptize someone, I say to them, buried with Christ. And they go down into the water. And they come back up. I say, resurrected into new life. Buried with Christ. And resurrected into new life. You have to start the process of growth with being alive. If I were to take a plant, a really easy one, like if you don't know, if you don't have a green thumb and you kill plants really easily, buy a ZZ plant, all right? Buy a ZZ plant, that's what they're called, and it's going to be green, it's going to be tall, it's going to be beautiful. Get it into a pot, right, and you're going to put the right soil in there, and you're going to put it in some sunlight, and you're going to add some water to it, and you're just going to watch that thing grow because it's got the soil, it's got the sun, it's got the water, it's great. Take a, a pot that's exactly the same size, the exact same soil, the exact same water, the exact same sunlight, and then take a dead stick and put it in there and see what happens. I'm telling you, nothing. You have to be alive to grow. So if you're in this room and you haven't yet started your relationship with Jesus, that's step one. You should do that today. I want to grow into Christ likeness. Well, Let's give your life to Jesus and let him start working in you. Here's the second thing. If you want to grow personally, number two, you need to expect the process to take time. Don't expect that you gave your life to Jesus yesterday and that you're some uh, biblical saint and scholar today. It takes time. It takes time. When you even read about some of the apostles growing in Christ-likeness, it took time to watch where, where John was, who wrote this passage, you know, where he was when he first gave his life to Jesus and said, I'm going to be a follower of you now, and then three years later where he was, and even beyond that as he's writing some of the incredible things we read about in Scripture. There's a man named, uh, you're probably familiar with D.L. Moody. Uh, In a biography about D.L. Moody, it was said about him that Dwight Moody was described as a menace to other believers after he gave his life to Jesus. And here's why. It says, he loved God's word so much that no one could keep up with him. His Sunday school teachers, he gave his life to Jesus Spends time reading through God's word over and over again. And he's showing up to Sunday school, right? And he's showing up with an excitement. He's asking questions that nobody else knows the answer to. He's asking questions that, that he's already arrived at a level of spiritual maturity beyond even those of his teachers. And they're just like, what are you doing? You're making me look bad. And I would love it if we were a church full of, of menaces in this way. And I would love it if someone would come up to me after service and say, hey, you know that Greek word you taught everybody today? You said it wrong. Here's how to say it right. I've been spending time learning some Greek. I've been spending time in God's word. I've been, man, how awesome would it be if we're all helping each other grow at a faster pace? And here we have D.L. Moody, who was growing much quicker than maybe others. But I just want you to know that you need to expect the process to take time. It's going to go faster if you spend more time in God's Word, and it's going to go really slowly if you spend less time in God's Word. You get to kind of work out that pace, but you should expect it to take time. Here's the third thing. How do you grow personally? You have to receive nourishment. You have to receive nourishment to grow. I think we understand that in a physical sense. If you don't feed yourself, You'll, you'll wither away to nothing and eventually die, right? You have to receive nourishment to grow. Here's what Peter says in 1 Peter 2. He says, like newborn babies, you must crave spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. And then it goes out and says this, cry out for this nourishment. Cry out for this nourishment. You know, babies only cry for a few specific reasons. Some of you probably know, what are some of the reasons babies cry? Let me hear them. Are hungry, I heard? Tired? They need to, what's that? A diaper change, yeah, that, that's, so we got three good ones. Hungry, tired, their, their diaper needs to be changed. Scared, or maybe they've hurting themselves, right? So if you hear a baby crying, it's usually not rocket science. 
There's, there's typically some way, once you learn your child's kind of patterns, why the baby's crying. But one of the main reasons your baby's crying is probably because they're hungry. They want to eat. They'll let you know when they're hungry. They haven't learned how to say those words yet. Well, well, Peter's saying, listen, how cool would it be if you actually cried out for spiritual milk, that you were hungry enough, that you were just ready, you wanted it so bad, like newborn babies, you were craving pure spiritual milk. In Jeremiah 15, the way he puts it, in verse 16, he says, when I discovered your words, here's the word of God, right? Jeremiah says, when I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God of heaven's armies. You know, this kind of reminds me, if, if I'm trying to think of an illustration that really helps me understand it, it would be similar to when I discovered In-N-Out Burger. You know, when I discovered In-N-Out Burger, if I were writing a, a, a passage of Scripture about In-N-Out Burger, it would be when I discovered In-N-Out Burger, I devoured it. I could go on. It was my joy and my heart's delight. <laughs> and then I bought a shirt in and out so I could bear your name. I really can't go on. I can't. The rest of the verse doesn't apply. But listen, how amazing would it be if we had so much desire to grow in our faith that we recognize I need nourishment and we, we read, it's really clear that the main source of nourishment for you to grow in your faith, it's not overly complicated, right? The main source of nourishment is very simple. It's spending time in the Word of God. If you are saying right now, I want to be a mover and a shaker. I, I found out where I'm at on this chart. Now, what do I need to do to spend? Well, right, first, you got to be alive. you got to expect it to take time. But third, and kind of most simple, you, you got you got to feed yourself. You can't come on Sunday morning starving. You got to spend time in God's word throughout the week growing. You know, one of the excuses a lot of people say is the reason they don't read God's word is like, listen, I read God's word and I don't understand what I'm reading. I love this pastor, uh, Adrian Rogers, and he has this quote and he says this, don't worry about what you don't understand. Obey what you do understand, and soon you will understand what you did not understand. When you open up God's word as a brand new baby in your faith, I promise you, you're going to read some things, and you're going to say, I don't even know what that means. It doesn't make any sense to me. That's okay. Keep reading. And eventually you're going to come across something that does make sense to you. And when you come across something that does make sense to you, obey that and start growing in your faith in, in Christ-likeness. And then before you know it, as you read, you're going to be understanding things that you never understood before because you're maturing in your faith. Hebrews 5, 7, or 5, 14 says this, solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have been, or have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. You know, we read in, you know, Peter was talking about craving spiritual milk, but we now also recognize that solid food on the other end is that later stage where you're now able to, listen, you don't want to take a, take a piece of steak and put it in your newborn's mouth. They're not going to be able to, to digest it. They're not going to be able to chew it. They're going to choke on it. But we grow to a place where instead of drinking milk, we're able to handle a T-bone. We're able to chew it and process it and swallow it at the right time and enjoy it and savor it. Speaking of savoring it, you know, there's a difference between reading God's Word and devouring God's Word. If you take a pipe as an example, you put water in one end of a pipe and it just comes out on the other end. And before you know it, you just have the same pipe you started with. It's nothing different about the pipe because the water went in and out. And sometimes what happens is we read God's word and we're just trying to check a box. And what we do is we, we process all the letters and how they form together to make words and how those words form together and make sentences. And we basically put that sentence in our head for a second, but we're just trying to get something done. And before the end of it, we're like, I have no idea what I read because I didn't really devour it. I just kind of quickly checked off a box today. I want to encourage you to chew on the word of God, to taste it, to enjoy it, 
There's certainly going to be things you don't understand. But take time to slow down and understand as much as you can. Obey what you do, and soon you'll understand what you don't understand. You know, another thing about D.L. Moody I learned is that early in his faith, what he did is he prayed to God for more faith. He was praying to God, God, would you give me even more faith? And then he came across a scripture while he was reading the word of God. And it it was this scripture where it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you know what he stopped doing? He stopped praying for more faith and just said, God, I, I got the answer. I'm gonna spend more time in your word. And by spending more time in your word and then hearing it and applying it to my life, that's gonna develop more faith in me. You know, there are other ways that you can nourish yourself. The main way we're talking about today is spending time in God's word. You can nourish yourself by listening to God in prayer. You can nourish yourself through private worship. There's nothing wrong with worshiping God when you're alone at home. I think it's awesome to set a pattern where you're listening to worship music and you have quiet, alone, private worship with God. That's a great way to nourish yourself between Sunday mornings. Scripture memory, man, that's such a great way to, to develop your faith is to take God's word and store it in your mind and in your heart. But ultimately, here's the kind of a, a overarching point is this, is that growth demands discipline and exercise. You have to use it or you lose it. It's going to take time developing. It, it takes you know, when you're exercising a muscle, you, you have to go and you got to work it out. You got to get a, a more weight on it. You got you to keep exercising it because if you don't, if you just stop exercising at all, right, all your muscles atrophy and before you know it, you just, you've lost the ability to do anything. And so we don't want that to happen in our faith. We want to be movers and shakers. So everyone do me a favor. Grab your, your notes that we used this morning and just kind of hold them up for, for a second. On the back of those notes, you'll notice that we have that that line that says, what now, God? Do you see it? For what now, God, what I want you to do, instead of me telling you what I think God might be telling you, I want you just to ask God right now, God, what is it that you want me to do based on the word I just heard? And then I want to challenge you on Sundays, not just to decide up here, what it is that you're going to do differently when you walk out of here, but I want you to write it down. I want you to keep that, keep those, uh, those note sheets maybe folded up in a, a crease of your Bible somewhere. And, and what you can do is you revisit those things a week from now, a month, uh, two years from now, you pull this out and it says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start spending time in God's word every day. You'll be able to see real quick, have you been doing it? Is that something that changed in your life back in August of 2023? It says in Colossians, I'm going to wrap up with this verse. Colossians verse 1. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. So church, I want you to write something down. What is it that God's asking you to do? And then do it. Apply it to your life if you want to be a mover and a shaker in your faith. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this morning together. Thank you for this body of believers, this family of believers that's gathered here together today to worship you corporately. God, we worship you through singing and we worship you through remembering. We worship you through opening your word. And as we opened your word today, it was very clear that you have a desire to see us grow from spiritual infancy into spiritual spiritual maturity. Would you show each of us in this room what it is that you want us to do so that we can become more like your son? God, what is it that we need to do in our habits of growing personally between Sundays so that we can look more like you. And then would you give us the courage and the grit 
to do whatever it takes to get that done, to be movers and shakers of taking that next step, whatever it is you've asked us to do. God, we give it to you. We thank you for putting that in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.